God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. So glad that you came to worship with us today. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the letter of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to talk with you for a few minutes this morning about the grace of giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. While you find your way there, do you like our new screens? Yeah. You enjoying those? We were, uh, we were overdue for a technology upgrade. Uh, we had digital projectors up on the ceiling. The lifespan on the projectors is three years. We managed to eke six years out of them. Uh, but they just, uh, they just were not cutting it anymore. And because of the amount of daylight in the room, uh, we just couldn't get the image bright enough. So we kept changing the bulbs in the projectors. But the bulbs were about $600 each bulb. So, uh, so we decided it was time to... Uh, upgrade and so I hope you enjoy the new screens. I don't want you to miss a single point of the sermon today so you're going to see it all in beautiful vivid high definition. Today is a, a bitter sweet day. Uh, I'll go with the sweet first. The sweet is that our friends Pastor Jason and Athia Grigori welcomed their new baby daughter into the world on Friday evening at 1130. <laughs> Little Abby May was born and uh, mom and dad and baby are all doing great. Uh, actually yesterday, Pastor Jason and Athea moved from North New Jersey to uh, Exit 1 in Danbury only because they were in the hospital. Uh, Jason's brother had to move them and so um, I don't know how many have ever moved house when you're not there to move house but uh, uh, just pray for them and they'll be joining us shortly uh, here in the Greenwich campus. That's the sweet. The bitter is that this is Pastor Jason Joseph's last Sunday with us here at Harvest Time. Uh, a number of weeks ago Pastor Jason came to me and shared with me that his father has taken a serious decline in his health and Pastor Jason feels like he's supposed to go home and just be with his father, care for his father and so he's leaving us and so we're going to receive at the end of the service today a special offering for Pastor Jason. We have put uh, an extra offering envelope in your bulletin today and if you'd like to share an offering you can use the offering envelope to do that. Um, I, I know we have many guests here this morning and so please don't feel obligated in any way but if you're part of our Harvest Time family and Pastor Jason has been a blessing to you um, then we'll give you an opportunity to just express your love for him at the end of the service. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and let's talk for a few minutes about the grace of giving. 2 Corinthians 8 and beginning in verse 1. Paul says and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace. Would you say that word grace with me? Grace. We want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. Titus, just as he had earlier to this offering, to bring to completion this act of grace. Would you say the word grace again with me? This act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love, see that you also excel in this, would you say it again, grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test, if, to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the, say it again, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jump over to chapter 9 and verse 6 with me, and let's read a few more verses. Chapter 9, verse 6. Paul says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all, one more time, grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound to every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase 
your store of seed and will enlarge your business. You will be enriched so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your gener generosity will result in giving to God. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence that we feel here with us. Thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. I pray, Father, that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen and amen. Well, a family went out for lunch after church, as they usually did. And after they sat down and they got settled, they began their weekly review of the service. The music was too loud. The mom said, and the air conditioning was too cold. The dad said, way too long today. The big sister said, the choir was awful. The little brother was surprised, listening to all their negative comments. Shrugging his shoulders, he said, I don't know, Dad. I saw what you put in the offering plate, and I thought it was a pretty darn good show for only a dollar. <laughs> for the last few weeks, we've been working our way through the letter of 2 Corinthians, and today we come to Paul's best-known words about giving. In chapters 8 and 9, Paul says that giving is all about grace, grace, grace. In fact, he uses the Greek word grace ten times in these two chapters. Looking at Paul's words, I see four truths about the grace of giving. And I want to share them with you quickly today. Four truths about the grace of giving. First this, Christian giving is rooted in grace. Beloved, I want to tell you that Christian giving is unlike any other kind of giving in the world. It is unlike philanthropy, even though there's nothing wrong with philanthropy. It's unlike humanitarian aid, even though there's nothing wrong with that. It is unlike social activism. Christian giving is a holy act of worship, according to Jesus. Christian giving is an act of gratitude. It's an act of faith and faithfulness. Christian giving is an act of love for Christ and for the body of Christ and for the gospel. Christian giving is sacred. Christian giving is a spiritual and a supernatural act. It is not the same as any other kind of charitable giving. It is not the same as any other kind of compassionate giving. Our Christian giving, including tithing, is not based on the law but on grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 gives the most important verse in the Bible on what is the basis of our Christian giving. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. At the end of chapter 9, Paul adds these words, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The basis of our Christian giving is the grace of God that was extended to us in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, left the riches of his heavenly existence and he traded it for the poverty of our earthly existence. The infinite, eternal God, the creator of everything, the one who is ever adored by the angels, the one who lives in unapproachable light, put on a body of human flesh and assumed a human nature into his divine nature, and he came to our badly sin-broken world. When in all of eternity was God ever cold or hungry or thirsty or sleep-deprived or sore or sick? When did God ever shiver in the darkness of night or swelter in the heat of day? When in all of eternity was God ever overcome with human disappointment or sorrow or anxiety or even anger? When was God ever scrutinized by his own creations, weighed by them, judged by them, 
and found wanting. The basis of our Christian giving is the grace of God that was extended to us in the cross of Jesus Christ. The earthly poverty of Jesus culminated in the cross. You know, crucifixion was a form of execution so cruel that Roman citizens could not even be sentenced to it. Crucifixion was reserved for slaves and the most vile criminals. Crucifixion was so grotesque that it was uncouth to even mention in polite conversation. In the Roman world, crucifixion was the ultimate statement of human worthlessness. Isaiah said he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance on the cross that we should desire him. We hid our faces from him. He was despised and we valued him not. He who was rich became poor for our sakes. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The basis of our Christian giving is the grace of God that has been extended to us personally in the gift of salvation. You see, in a moment of divine grace, the earthly poverty of Jesus brought heavenly riches to us. In a moment of grace, God caused his light to shine in our darkened hearts. In a moment of grace, God revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus. In a moment of grace, God reconciled us to himself, not counting our sins against us. In a moment of grace, God transferred Christ's own righteousness onto us. In a moment of grace, God made us into new creations and he deposited into our miserable earthen vessels the glory glorious deposit of his presence what is the basis of our giving God gave himself to save us we are the recipients of amazing grace we are the recipients of heavenly riches we are the recipients of God's indescribable gift and grace received begets joy and joy begets instinctive generosity. In the beginning of chapter 8, Paul brags on the Macedonian Christians. Those were believers in the city of Thessalonica and Philippi and Berea. Over a period of five years, Paul traveled and asked the churches that he planted to all participate in a huge offering for the struggling believers in Jerusalem. But the Christians in Macedonia were experiencing so much persecution of their own that Paul planned to leave them out of the offering. But something happened. The grace of God that they had received caused an unquenchable joy to well up inside their spirits and joy overflowed intuitively in generosity. The Macedonians begged Paul for the privilege of participating in that offering. You know, so many people today complain about preachers always begging for money. It wasn't that way in the New Testament. No, in the New Testament, God's people begged to give. Beloved, when joy is present, nothing can stop God's people from giving. When joy is present, earthly troubles cannot stop people from giving. When joy is present, human opposition cannot stop people from giving. When joy is present, financial hardships and financial lack cannot stop people from giving. This was the joy in the widow's heart when she dropped her last two coins into the temple treasury. This was the joy in the forgiven woman's heart when she broke open her alabaster box of precious perfume and lavished it all over Jesus. This was the joy in Zacchaeus' heart when he gave half of all of his wealth to the poor and the other half to compensate those whom he had cheated far beyond the requirements of the law. 
This was the joy in the hearts of the first believers in Jerusalem when they gave all that they had so that no one among them was in need. This was the joy in Barnabas' heart when he sold his land and gave all the proceeds to the church. This was the joy in Lydia's heart when she opened her home to Paul and his companions and insisted that they stay there as her guests. This was the joy in Abraham's heart when he gave his tithe to Melchizedek. And when he taught his sons to tithe. I want to take a moment and clarify something about tithing today. Tithing is not based on the Mosaic law. Tithing is based on grace. Abraham is the spiritual father of all those who live by grace. Abraham believed God. And God credited righteousness to Abraham, not counting his sins against him. Abraham received grace looking ahead to the seed, Yeshua, the Messiah. And grace overflowed in intuitive generosity. Abraham tithed, and Abraham taught his son Isaac to tithe, and Isaac taught his son Jacob to tithe. Now listen, several hundred years later, tithing was codified under the law of Moses, but tithing did not begin with the law, and it didn't end with the law. Tithing began in grace, and it continues in grace. Thou shalt not commit murder was codified under the law, but murder was prohibited by God before the law, and it is still prohibited by God after the law, just in case you're wondering. Even though it was codified under the law for a season, it stands apart from the law. Honor your father and mother was codified under the law, but God required that honor before the law, and it is still required after the law, so Jesus himself taught us. Hey, even though it was codified under the law for a season, it stands apart from the law. And the same thing is true with tithing. Even though tithing was codified under the law of Moses for a season, it stands apart from the law. To dismiss tithing as something that only applies to the agricultural economy of Israel during the period of the law is to dismiss everything else the Bible has to say about it. And I would add that Yeshua assumed tithing in Matthew 6, and he affirmed tithing in Matthew 23, 23. Although tithing was codified under the law for a time, it is not of the law, it is of grace. Well, you're not shouting, so I better move on to the next point. <laughs> Four truths about the grace of giving. Christian giving is rooted in grace. And second, Christian giving is empowered by grace. Paul tells the Corinthians that the grace the Macedonians received begot unquenchable joy, and unquenchable joy begot instinctive generosity. And something inexplicable happened. God supernaturally enabled the Macedonians to give far beyond what they were humanly able. Paul says in verse 7 that their giving rose to the level of a charismata, a gift of the Holy Spirit. Via the Holy Spirit, they received a measure of grace that enabled them to do something beyond their human limitations. And Paul tells the Corinthians that they too can experience this supernatural charismata, this gift of the Holy Spirit, this grace of giving. In chapter 9, Paul goes on to explain that when we instinctively give with a joyful heart, we enter into the supernatural mathematics of God's economy. There are two ways that grace empowers our giving. First of all, God supernaturally enables us to give more than humanly possible in order to meet a ministry need. Beloved, can I tell you what God did for the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8? We have seen God do again and again here at harvest time. You know, when we were building this building, God opened the windows of heaven and he poured out unexpected showers of provision on his people. People received new jobs and promotions. 
People received pay raises. They received unexpected bonuses. People made sales and received commissions far beyond so many stories. People received accounts receivable and other money that was due to them that they had written off long ago. People inexplicably paid up. People received inheritances. My wife and I received during that period two unexpected inheritances that we had no idea were going to come to us. When it was all said and done in our first capital campaign, our congregation gave 50% more than what they had pledged. One of my favorite stories is of a sister who had just lost her husband. Actually, he was on the building committee when we found this property. After decades out of the workforce, she had to go back to work. She took an office job with a startup company here in Greenwich. And she and her husband, before he passed, had agreed on a pledge to this building that was far beyond what she could possibly meet on her own. After just a couple weeks at her new job at a new company, she discovered that she had to go out for eye surgery. She was out of work for weeks and weeks while she was recuperating. When she came back to work the next day, her boss called her into the office and she thought, oh boy, this is it, I'm gonna get sacked. I was only on this job for two or three weeks and I've been out for weeks and weeks, but instead of getting sacked, her boss took out an envelope. And he said to her, I just want you to know how valuable you are to this company and how much we appreciate you and he handed her a bonus that was exactly the amount of money that she and her husband had pledged to give to this building. That's the kind of thing that our great God does. Come on, he deserves better than just a little golf clap for that. And I want to tell you that God is doing it again. Several people have already come and shared stories with me of new jobs, of promotions, of bonuses and inheritances, things that God is doing for them. Two ways that grace empowers our giving. Not only does God give us more, but he also causes what we have to supernaturally stretch to somehow meet the need. In chapter 8, verse 15, Paul recalls the miracle of manna in the wilderness. I want you to listen up because you're going to hear the most amazing thing you've ever heard about manna. Paul says that day by day, God miraculously caused each person's manna to be exactly what he needed or she needed for the day. He gives a little quote from the book of Exodus. He that gathered little did not gather too little, and he that gathered much did not gather too much. Listen to this. Not only was the manna miraculous in its source, but it was miraculous in its substance. Think about this. That manna, millions of people, toddlers and children and teenagers and young adults and uh, middle-aged adults and seniors, and somehow that manna, that one food source, somehow met the nutritional needs of each individual. And that manna, listen to this, miraculously, miraculously measured itself to become exactly the right portion that each person needed. Beloved, that is precisely what God does with our gifts that come from joyful hearts. In chapter 9, verse 8, Paul says when we give gifts from a joyful heart, God puts his grace on that gift so that it becomes exactly what is needed to satisfy the need. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, you have all that you need to abound to every good work. Can I tell you that God is doing that for phase two? To be perfectly honest with you, 18, 19 months ago when we launched the Jump In campaign, I had no idea how we were ever going to acquire enough money to build this building. I believe with my whole heart that phase two is God's will. I believe that we were in God's timing. I believe that it would happen, but I had no clue how God was going to do it. When Tim Holmes, our construction manager, submitted our budget to the Assemblies of God, every number that he calculated assumed the absolute most favorable conditions in the market for materials and for labor. They were impossibly low numbers. If absolutely everything went in our favor, we might have a shot at making those numbers. 
but so far you've given a little over two million dollars to the jump in campaign and because you've given with joy God has supernaturally taken those gifts and he stretched them to be enough to meet the need you know we haven't touched a dollar of loan money yet Here's what the Lord has done for us. Listen, at the outset of the project, we were able to replace costly foundation pumps that were supposed to be buried in the ground with a gravity drain that runs to the back of the property. Because of the gravity drain, we were able to redesign the entire foundation and we saved $225,000 off the construction costs of the building. <laughs> Plus the long-term cost of maintaining and operating those pumps. The first two estimates, listen to this one. In the words of Donald Trump, this is huge. Listen to this. The first two estimates on steel came back. The, the low estimate was $2.3 million. The high estimate was $2.9 million. If we had to even meet that lower number, there's no way that we would have enough money to finish this building. With the help of our friend Glenn Fox, who was here at the early service, and Ciro, who's standing in the back. Ciro builds bridges in New York City. He's responsible for the traffic on the Van Wick, so you can bless him anytime you go to JFK. But there's two massive beams that hold up the building. They're going to be delivered soon. And uh, we, we seriously, we had a hard time finding someone that could even manufacture the beams. One company that makes them, they only run them once a year. And so if we missed the cycle, we'd have to wait 12 months to get in the queue to, to get the beams run. And Ciro looked at the drawings and said, we, we manufacture, we fabricate beams bigger than that every day. And he connected us with a contractor who makes steel for bridges. And from a high number of 2.9 million, our number on the steel is $1.2 million. Waterproofing, we budgeted $100,000 to waterproof the foundation and the concrete contractor came to us and said he's going to include the waterproofing in the scope of his work without charging us anything more, $100,000 saved. With the help of our friend Richard Estacio, who's sitting in the back, we have saved $100,000 on the plumbing and Richie is doing, he's one of the best contractors in Fairfield County and in New York and he's doing a beautiful job for us and we, we beat our budget. Architect fees. In January, we were shocked to find out that after 110 years in business, our architect firm filed for bankruptcy. And we thought, oh Lord, this is a disaster. We have to have an architect to finish the building. But, you know, we were obligated. We had $120,000 that we were left obligated to pay on the contract. And when they filed for bankruptcy, the contract went bye-bye and the architect said, you know what? He said, I'll finish the rest of the project for you gratis. That's $120,000 that we saved. And here's my favorite. We have to put in a new elevator and we got the elevator contract for $17,000 less than what we budgeted for that. If you add all that up, that is somewhere between $1.6 and $2.2 million that we have saved off the cost of the construction of this building. How is God doing it? He's doing it by grace, grace, grace. We have about one year left to go on the construction and we need both kinds of miracles to keep happening in order to finish phase two. We still have about $1.4 million in pledges that need to be received from Jump In and we need all of those pledges to come in in order to finish the building. That's why we're praying more and more provision over you and we still need God to help us beat those impossibly lo low numbers. But God has done it. God is doing it. And I believe that he's going to help us do it all the way through to the end. Four truths about the grace of giving. Christian giving is rooted in grace. It's empowered by grace. And third, Christian giving releases more grace on the givers. In chapters 8 and 9, Paul describes two different kinds of hearts when it comes to giving. One kind of heart gives as a debt, gives under compulsion. It gives sparingly, it gives begrudgingly. The other kind of heart gives freely and willingly. It gives bountifully. It gives cheerfully. 
John Piper says that the fundamental difference between these two kinds of hearts is that one heart views God as a taker and the other heart views God as a giver. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus told a parable about a king who gave a deposit to three servants to invest while he went away on a trip. When the king returned a long time later, he called the servants to see what they had done with his money. Two of the servants doubled the king's money, but the third servant had done nothing with it at all. When the king asked why, the third servant said, I know that you're a harsh man. You harvest where you have not sown. You collect money where you have not invested. In other words, that third servant, he regarded the king as a taker. But you know, absolutely nothing could have been further from the truth. In fact, the king was a giver. He had given them a deposit, had he not? And the king was a generous rewarder to the two who invested the king's deposit. He not only let them keep their earnings, but he heaped much more reward on top of it. Beloved, that's the kind of king that we have. He is not a taker. He is a giver, and he is a generous rewarder. And he gives on both ends of the sowing and reaping cycle. He gives us the initial seed to sow. From that seed, he gives us bread to eat, and he gives us more seed to sow. Christian giving, it begins in grace. It's empowered by grace, and it releases more grace on the givers. In chapter 9, Paul says God does two things for joyful givers. First, God gives joyful givers enough to live and enough to give. You know, in the world's accounting, the more you hold on to, the more you have. But in the supernatural economy of heaven, the more that you give away the more God multiplies what remains. Paul says here, if you give with a joyful heart, God will multiply grace to you so that you will always have enough to live and enough to give. I like these words, all, 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 every. Come on, I want you to say that with me. All, 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 every. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, you will have all that you need to succeed in every good work. In chapter 9, verse 10, Paul says he will provide seed for the sowing and bread for the eating. Bread for eating means enough to live, and seed for sowing means enough to give. Beloved, listen to me. Give joyfully to the Lord. Give joyfully to Harvest Time Church. Give joyfully to missions. Give joyfully to phase two. Give joyfully to help people in want and in need, and God will supernaturally ensure that you will have enough to live this coming year and enough to give to meet your pledge. I believe it. Two things God does for joyful givers. Second, God gives joyful givers contentment with what they have. In chapter 9, verse 8, Paul says that God gives us the grace of contentment with what he gives us. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that it says in the Greek so that you are satisfied, so that you are filled with contentment. You know, it's one thing to have enough. But it's quite another thing when enough is enough. For some people, enough is never enough. Even though they have plenty, they are trapped in a poverty mentality. They're depressed over what they don't have. They're driven to accumulate more. Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But he says, godliness with contentment, now that is great gain. Solomon said it this way, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. You see, when you're a joyful giver, God will give you enough to live and enough to give and enough will be enough for you. 
Four truths about the grace of giving. Finally this. Christian giving spreads grace to others. In chapter 8, Paul says, your offering is an act of service to others. In chapter 9, he calls the offering a gracious blessing. He says, your generosity will overflow in many expressions of thanks to God. Men will praise God because of the surpassing grace that has been given to you. How does giving spread grace? First of all, your gracious giving spreads God's love to God's family. The giving of the Gentile churches became a tangible expression of God's love for the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. And the same thing is true of our giving. God translates it into tangible expressions of his love for others in his family. You know, because we give, we have a home here for God's family to share. Because we give, we have a place to experience his presence in worship and in the word. Because we give, we have pastors to lead ministries for kids and teenagers and families and adults. Because we give, we have resources on hand to help people in time of need. I'm so excited about the divorce care ministry that's about to start next week for adults and for children and pathways for teenagers. I was 16 years old when my parents separated and then later divorced and you know those are resources that just weren't there in the church at that time and oh how I wish they were there now we're going to be able to spread God's love to people at a time when they're most vulnerable when they're hurting the most when they're most open to just receiving God's love and it's possible because you've given we're getting ready to start a new ministry, a support ministry for single parents. And we plan to start that by, before the end of this year so that our single moms and our single dads know that they are not alone raising their children, that they're part of a family of God who's surrounding them and supporting them. And it's possible because you've given. How does giving spread grace to other? Your gracious giving inspires others to give too. Listen to this. When Paul told the Macedonians what the Corinthians had pledged to give, the Macedonians begged to give. And when Paul told the Corinthians what the Macedonians had given them, it inspired the Corinthians to go ahead and actually meet their pledges. See, that's the way it works. When believers hear about the grace of giving on one group, the grace of giving falls on them too. How does giving spread grace? Your gracious giving brings the reward of intercession. The Jerusalem church wasn't able to reciprocate with a financial offering to the Gentile churches, but they reciprocated with their prayers instead. Paul says in chapter 9, their hearts will go out to you and they will make intercession for you. They'll pray for you. There's one thing the Jerusalem church knew how to do. It was to pray. And if there was one thing the Gentile churches needed, it was prayer. Do you know that because you give to Harvest Time missions, there are people praying for you all around the world. There are people praying for you in Trinidad and in Kenya and in Ukraine and in Malaysia and in Indonesia and Myanmar and in Ecuador. And there's one thing that the church overseas knows how to do. I know I've been there. It's they know how to pray. And if there's one thing that the church in America needs, it's prayer. So there is this reciprocity of grace, Paul says. Your plenty will supply the finances that they need, and their plenty will supply the prayers that you need. How does giving spread grace? Your gracious giving causes onlookers to give thanks to God. Paul says that when we give, in the eyes of spectators, we are putting our money where our mouth is. He says men will praise God because of the obedience that accompanies your confession of faith. Beloved, can I tell you that phase two is a statement. There are eyes all over watching us. People have told me, how is this church going to do that big of a project? People are watching us. But I want to tell you, that building is going to be beautiful and it's going to be tangible evidence that we believe that Jesus is worthy and that God is great and he is greatly to be praised. 
For truths about the grace of giving, rooted in grace, empowered by grace, releases more grace on the givers and spreads grace around to others. I want the worship team to come help me. Now to these four truths, very quickly, I want to throw a few final comments about where should we give. Where should we give? Don't have time to look at all the verses in detail, but let me just give you a few principles out of these chapters. Where should we give? First of all, give where God has willed you to be connected. Paul says that the Macedonians were connected to him by God's will. Beloved, it is so important that you know where God has willed for you to be connected. Where does God want you to grow in Christ? Where does God want you to develop your gifts? Where does God want you to serve and minister? Where does God want you to plant your family? If God has willed you to be connected here, then give here. Where should we give? Second, give where you receive. The Macedonians and the Corinthians had received from Paul, so they gave to Paul. Give where you receive from the word and the worship. Give where you receive pastoral care and pastoral prayer. Give where you receive friendship and fellowship. Give where your family receives ministry. Where should we give? Number three, give where honor is due. For Paul, the Jerusalem offering was all about showing honor where honor was due. If it hadn't been for the courage of the Jerusalem church, Christianity would have never survived past the first year. If it hadn't been for their sacrifices, Christianity would have never spread beyond the borders of Israel. If it hadn't been for their prayers, Paul would have never become the apostle to the Gentiles. And in the same way, God is pleased when we show honor where honor is due by giving to those ministers and those ministries who led us to Christ and who have discipled us in Christ. That's why every year we honor Pastor Tate, our uh, founding pastor. We send him an offering every year just to give honor where honor is due. Where should we give? Give where there is godly order and earthly accountability. Don't have time to look at all these verses, but Paul goes into great detail in chapter 8 about who will be handling the offering and how it will be handled. Paul says, we take great pains to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord and in the eyes of men. Can I brag on our board of deacons for a minute? Can I brag on our building committee and our missions committee? Can I brag on our staff here? They take great pains to make sure that our offerings are handled in a way that is right in the eyes of the Lord and in the eyes of men. And I want to tell you that's one of the reasons I believe that God has blessed Harvest Time so much over 31 years. It's because God is able to trust our leaders with what our people have given. Where should we give finally this? Give to God-ordained good works. Paul says God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, you have all you need to abound in every good work. Or maybe we could say to every God-ordained work. Beloved, before we were even born again, God ordained each of us to do some good works. Someone said it like this. God gave me a few things to accomplish here on this earth, and right now I'm so far behind, I will never die. But I want to tell you this, harvest time is a God-ordained good work. 1338 King Street is a God-ordained good work. Phase one is a God-ordained good work. Phase two is a God-ordained good work. And what lies beyond phase two is a God-ordained good work. This is good soil for your seed. This is good ground for your giving. This is a good place to be planted, and it is a good place to plant. Four truths about the grace of giving, and where should we give? Now, just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in earnestness, in love, may God also help you to excel in this grace of giving. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place today.